What's up, everyone? Welcome. We are live right now on Cannabis. And if you're joining us on YouTube or Spotify out there in the podcast sphere, thank you so much for joining us. We have a great episode for you today. We have Dr. Colin Bell. We're going to be talking all about bacteria and fungi. So we, uh, we're we going to get into all sorts of science and grow science and all sorts of things in this episode. But before we get too far into it, we need to make uh, a couple shout outs. First off, shout out to everyone in the Cannabis community. We live stream all these interviews to our community so folks can join in and ask live questions. We also do giveaways. We do seed giveaways, all sorts of things to the supporters and their support helps us do things like send jr out to farms to do videos like he did a, a few weeks back um we do we went to emerald cup earlier this year so your support is really uh helpful and we'd love to see you in there so search cannabis in the app store or go to cannabis.app download the app and use the code buzz for a free month also, shout out to LostCoastPlantTherapy.com. If you need a spray to help knock down some bugs or other things that are trying to take down your plants, check out LostCoastPlantTherapy.com. It's a really great, like, kind of soap uh, based spray that has some alcohol on there. So it evaporates really quickly. It's really helpful in the grow. Both JR and I use it and we really appreciate their support, uh, for cannabis. And then last shout out for me before I throw it over to JR, actually a couple shout outs. First off, we are kind of looking at potential sponsors or trying to kind of put the word out there, at least taking incoming words. So if you are a company that, especially if you're in lights or other things that are looking to sponsor a little podcast, podcast or YouTube show, uh, hit us up. You can email JR, you can email Sam at cannabuzz.app. And then last shout out from me, we'll go to our friends over at sacred3mushrooms.com. Sacred3mushrooms.com. You can get grow kits to grow your own edible fungi or other types of fungi if you're into that sort of thing. It's a kit that you can get for about 80 bucks and it's got everything you need. Uh, instructions, um, all sorts of things. You're good to go if you go with them and they've uh, great support if you need to email them. So make sure to go to sacred3mushrooms.com and use the code CANNABUS for 10% off. And then JR looks like he's setting up some technical stuff. I don't know. Are you there? Are you ready to go, JR? Oh, man, that was brutal. Uh, <laughs> the power cord to to my PC decided to uh, not work. So I had to switch it to another outlet. But look at me. I did it. Uh, yeah, for Tiki announcements, uh, he's got the What the F Black Friday sale. And that's going to be 40% off of TikiSeeds.com. Uh, and Tiki's been a big supporter for us from day one, and he has some fire genetics that he offers. And um, this one's going to be interesting. You get a free pack of Party Boy with every order, and he even had Party Boy from Jackass do a little uh, ad for him. So check that out as well. Uh, and then I also want to uh, shout out um, uh, heliosupply.com uh, for that new Helio smart battery. Um, it's really excellent. How do you like it so far, Q? It's pretty good. Yeah, you charge it up uh, with USB-C and the vape part like fits in there. So like we were saying on last week's episode, it's like really good stealthy if you need to kind of be out and about with a weed vape and you don't want to be obvious that you have a weed vape or like going to a concert. It's another one. Uh, you could use something like this. So yeah, I, I like it. And they ha have a bunch of other types of things too. So check them out. Helio supply. That's H E L I O supply.com. And then they gave us a code. Is that right? JR? Yeah. It's cannabis is the code and they were generous. A lot of companies uh, sometimes aren't so generous with what they offer for your people. And they gave us 15% off for any order. So if you order with Cannabis as the code, uh, you get that 15% off, which I thought was cool. Nice. Well, um, JR, I guess for a change, I'll let you kick it off because you and Colin are good friends. You've known Colin for a long time. Uh, you know, your relationship predates Cannabis. And, you know, Colin was an early friend of ours with Cannabis. Um, I think we were talking about the idea or whatever with you back at Emerald Cup, like five, six years ago or whatever. But uh, yeah, JR, let's kick off the show. Well, I just want to welcome Colin, Dr. Colin Bell. Um, I want to thank him for his time and being a friend of the show. 
Uh, Colin has given us his time on several occasions, and uh, Colin's a very busy man. Um, he's working with MIM Horticulture right now, and they have a microbial package that they're offering. Uh, and today, uh, we're going to be talking a lot about bacteria and fungi. So welcome to the show, Dr. Bell. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure, and it's always <laughs> great to see you guys, of course. Awesome. Well, so JR put together a bunch of great questions for us, but before we get into the bacteria and the fungi stuff, um, tell us about your new uh, gig, where, where you're at, uh, MIM Horticulture. It sounds like you're doing some cool stuff, so let's uh, let's hear yeah, about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So listen, I've been with them almost two years now. It's scary how fast time flies. Uh, after I left Mammoth for, you know, just reasons I think we've talked about in the past, I wanted to find an opportunity where I could work with great technology and work with great people. And that's where I came together with MIM. MIM Horticulture was born uh, just north of us in Canada. Great research group that developed a technology that was really well thought out. It was, I think, inspired by my first technology that I developed at Colorado State University, Mammoth P, which was phosphorus solubilizing bacteria have the patents. I still have the patents and the license to that technology and the brand, obviously, trademark Mammoth. We all know that. These guys are competitive. They wanted to compete against that product. Um, they did a great job. Mammoth was not in Canada. They developed uh, a consortia of five bacteria. These are gram-positive bacteria. Three of them were focused on phosphorus cycling. Two of them were included in the formula focused on more root initiation. So it's an early one-two punch, early rooting and later stage bloom stimulant solution. Microbial, it's organically certified in Canada. It's not organically certified in the United States because of one stabilizer, but it's all natural. The interesting thing about this particular technology that I liked a lot about it is one, the intention focused on function, the root and bloom intention. Also, these are actually gram-positive dormant microbes, so they're dormant in the bottle in a very, very clean, precision, pharma-grade carrier, which allows it to be 100% precision. And the nice thing about having dormant bacteria, they're very common in agriculture, focused on the ones that really had the function. And because they're dormant, they have a really long shelf life and they have great compatibility because of the carrier. And so not all companies put the whole piece together. It seems like a pretty simple recipe. It's got to work really good. It has to have clear MOAs or modes of action. It has to make the plant move and it has to be compatible across the supply chain and across all the management practices. So having a very clean carrier dormant microbes allows this particular formula to be delivered to the plant. However, the management practices through irrigation is very, very common. And it allows um, the growers not only to be used, the pro growers to use the product as er at early root stimulant, which is very, very po popular in the large cultivation facilities and to carry it through bloom. That's so now with them being in Canada, do they have different sourcing um, abilities for their micro products? And like, say we might have here in the States, because I know for certain microbes, there's a it's, there's a limited source as to where you can get these. Well, I think that uh, I think that's regulated by the Department of Agriculture in Canada and you know in the states there's microbes that are on a list that you just cannot use they call it the ban list there's a pretty egregious do not use microbial list in Canada and i ran into that when um we were registering mammoth pea for Canada back in the day uh with grossentia and it required a reformulation because a couple of the microbes that were in the original formula that i developed at the university were not able to be registered in Canada. So there's uh, some inherent uh, ease of access um, details. When you're in, in country, it's a little easier to register when you have actually sourced the microbes from that country. 
and you just have to follow the, the the requirements based on the microbes that are being used. One example, Bacillus thuringiensis, you may have heard of that. It's a very commonly used bacteria in, in agriculture in the United States. It's banned in Canada. And so I don't understand some of the rationale the regulators use. When I was registering, when we were registering in, in the previous company, for example, Mammoth P in Australia, we went through a lot of red tape to prove that the microbes that were in Mammoth P could also be found indigenously on that particular continent because they didn't want to import foreign microbes. So there's a lot of considerations and not only the considerations, but what the product does. Pesticides are a whole other ball game. If you're starting to kill things, it's even a lot harder to get products registered. I noticed that even some uh, products now change their name to a plant wash. Did you uh, see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw yeah. that recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's pretty so, good. Yeah, and so I'll, I'll tell you, and I'm not trying to disrespect um, that process, but it is a little bit of a game, and there is a little bit of a strategy. And so you have to have a strategy based on your outcome. And if you're really trying to get products in the market, sometimes you reduce your claims, and right. maybe you have to change your name to get in there. And it's a, I talked about a game. It's a claim game. That's what it is. Whatever you're claiming has requirements from a registration point of view. And that's why you'll find a, a, a lot of claims often are missing on a label because of the ease of registration. Yeah, I've noticed that too. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I think it would be a great way to kind of set things up for the rest of the show. If you could kind of explain to people why this stuff is important. Why is bacteria and fungi important to growers? We're going to talk about bacteria in particular was like the, you know, the next section that we were going to jump off into, but sure. I, I thought it'd be great if you could just kind of like set the table for everyone listening. Yeah, sure. Happy to. And, you know, again, this is my perception and I'm biased. I have a PhD in microbiology and I think of, you know, bridging nature tech into agriculture as one of my purposes professionally and kind of this personal academic purpose that I've that I've developed over the years. Once I, you know, the reason Mammoth P existed was because we wanted to make a difference in agriculture. And what we saw as scientists at Colorado State University was the future of agriculture. We perceived the future of agriculture to be that of a balanced approach, where obviously there's salts and they're not going to go away and plants need nutrients. When I say salts, I mean nutrients. So that's a part of agriculture. It's a part of growing crops, the ions. We also know that there's a lot of problems in agriculture when heavy management, heavy nutrient and salt applications have been uh, approached for on a decadal level, there's a lot of great studies that over the course of a decade, you could see the health and the structure and the biology of a soil degrade significantly. And, you know, we think of soil as kind of this foundation to support plant growth and plants are the primary producers on earth that support all of their life. So it's the stuff they're growing in is important. And in many cases we've you know, degraded soils, agriculture practices have degraded soils to the point where they're dependent on these inputs. And then it creates a real interesting economic and imbalance of soil sustaining life soil sustaining primary well, productivity well what it sets you up for is food that is not nutrient dense and you're growing hydroponically basically because it's almost lifeless medium that you're in and everything that plant is getting is what you're giving it and so that creates those lack of nutrient available nutrients for our food and also as cannabis growers we can look at that in the same respect in that if we're growing in an inert medium then we need to be responsible for everything that that plant gets where if we're maybe in a living soil situation where those uh, exchanges are happening uh, enzymatically and ionically uh, then that is a totally different way for the plant to ask and bring up what it wants. Um, and I want to kind of move forward. One of the questions I had in this bacterial segment 
uh, was to kind of walk through uh, maybe the four common types of growth styles and how uh, a bacterial inoculant would maybe apply to those. Yeah, great. Let's do that. So let's start off with rock I, wool. I was, yeah. was going to say, Jay, I really like that analogy. I think that's a really interesting way to, to look at agriculture in general. The less the soil can sustain that uh, and support plant growth, the more it turns into some type of inert substrate and requires that management, which there's costs. There's a lot of challenges with the nutrition of food. And, you know, I was the why. Biology is important because biology turns that around. And biology, one of the things that we learned about biology, so let's talk about bacteria early on. Fungi have a role here too in nature and in agriculture and in hydroponics. We'll jump right into the question, is improving nutrient use efficiency. The idea is as we add nutrients into the substrate, into the soil, we want the plants to take them up. And if the plants can take them all up, there's a balanced approach where we don't have these residuals in soil, which acts as a pollution, uh, a, a source of pollution among other things. So in, in the environment and in, in outdoor settings, this nutrient use efficiency is critical because we see a lot of nitrate and phosphorus pollution as a result of overmanagement without the ability of the plants to utilize what's being fed to the soil. So what's your opinion on uh, folks that are talking about um, Leonardo uh, lignite for humic and fulvic applications in large scale agriculture as a way to kind of break away from those dependencies? Well, I think that, you know, if it works and it's economic and you can scale it, it's great. You know, there's a lot of these solutions that, I don't know enough to understand, you know, I know about the importance of humic and the ability and fulvic and the ability that it initiates for the, the plants to take up more. Um, and so there's a value there, but it's a, that's a complex question because it depends on the system. It depends on, um, on the practice of the farmer. And there's another example where there was a, you know, when I was at still at the university and we were doing a lot of studies with, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the carbon, the carbon black is what I call it, but there's a lot of these char, the, uh, what's it called? The biochar. Yeah. Biochar. biochar. <laughs> the, yeah. Biochar. It's a big thing for a while. There was a lot of yeah. beetle kill. And so a lot of biochar facilities were harvesting these trees, creating biochar. And it was going to save agriculture, JR, but the economics never could work out shipping that stuff and getting it to the density that needed to be on the field, it just broke that whole industry apart. And you hear about it, but you don't hear about it in broad scale agriculture, which was what everyone was very excited about when we started this gig. Not that oh, there yeah. isn't a function there, but there's a lot of details that that are important to validate. And so, you know, I, I'd say if it works, that's great. But then you have to make sure that it works on the crop and the soil. There's all these details and it works within the economics. Farming is really, really tricky. A lot of land is farmed with crops that can't sustain anything else. You know what I'm saying? Like the farmer can't put anything on it. And some years it gets so commoditized and the prices drop that they let it go and just take their crop insurance. So there's it's that's that's a a, a monster problem to solve and there's a lot of details depending on the crop and the area to actually kind of address that question well i imagine one of your hurdles is trying to explain to these folks that hey you got to kind of trust the process it's not going to happen overnight because i know that regeneratively um just with implements alone, it can take generations to rebuild soil structures and soil biology. And so these people, like you said, are so dependent on this cycle of growing. And you're trying to get them to understand that we need to move in this other direction. Uh, how do you get them to just to take that first step? I have an answer for that because I went out and, you know, I've done this. I've asked hundreds of farmers and I did this with the early technology mammoth P. I have something. I think it brings you value. This is how we think it works. We're talking early days when we were actually validating it before it was had a name. 
You know, when we were just going through incubators, me and my co-founder and trying to find that market and start thinking about how to think about market discovery. And, you know, that process actually landed us in the, uh, gratefully landed us into the cannabis industry. It was a National Science Foundation funded project. And I remember being up on stage saying, we found the market we're going into at the very end of this, you know, uh, process. Um, and it was like, a, you know, you're pitching every week and doing all this crazy stuff. I was like, we're going into cannabis. And I was very c- concerned about that. We're talking 2015. Yeah, it was early days. And it was a federal, a federal federally funded <laughs> uh, program, but we had fun doing it. So what I'll tell you, JR's agriculture in general, we're talking in general and adoption in agriculture moves at a snail's pace. And how farmers, I'll generalize this, try something new, and this is dependent on the crop and the area a little bit, is typically if there's a compelling reason that they'll get, they know the economics will work at scale, and they know there's some type of ROI that makes sense for them because they're a business and they're ROI return dependent. They'll try it on a row. Typically, they have one plot where they're trying little things. It's not that they don't want to try anything. And if there's compelling data to allow them to try it that second year, meaning they saw something that was compelling, they'll try it on a larger scale, maybe. I, and, I, and it's a 10-year process. It's a five to 10-year process. And, and that's you, you're hearing the problem here, right? Their paradigm of adoption doesn't allow for that 15 year span of, Hey, we're having to take this leap of, there's no leap of faith. This is a every year type of return. And, and so there's so many technologies that get into year four and year five. And for whatever reason, there's a crop failure. And then the technology hits the wall because they're attributing some type of crop failure to those products they're using. So the adoption cycle for agriculture is ridiculously cumbersome. So that vision is quite a tricky one. Well, let's get into the bacteria, my friend. Let's get into the new. Nutri- <laughs> let's get into the nutrient cycling. Um, yeah. So what I did is I laid down basically four growing styles, um, and I, what I would like to do is walk through each one of those and have you tell me how these microbial strategies would apply uh, uh, to these cannabis growers. Uh, the first yep. I want to talk about is rock wool and synthetics. Yep. Um, that seems to be, to me, the hardest barrier for you to probably want to jump into in the cannabis realm. Yeah, I don't, I, I would push back on that. I don't think so. I think it makes the most sense personally. Um, but w- I'm not give you the concept of microbes. You want them there and it's a probability game. You want to have a program no matter what, where if you're using a particular microbe, especially if you're using a functionally targeted microbe and you expect something from that additive, you want to have that density saturating your roots and whatever program can keep those microbes in that root zone. And those are going to be different across the substrate and different management practices, but that's the target. Hydroponically, you know, I would say, the microbial technologies that I've been closest to, the ones I'm currently working with and in the past, work very well with rock wool. And I'll even take that into the cocoa, which I think is a very similar type of regime. It's super inert, super porous. Obviously, rock wool is the most. You know, you're running into issues more so with how to manage those substrates from a fertigation point of view. And I would say that the microbes aren't distressed. The ones I've worked with, with high salt content and even with disinfection, you know, as a microbiologist, as a PhD microbiologist, not only am I an expert at growing microbes, I'm an expert at killing them. And I've taken these solutions and exposed microbes to high salt environments and disinfectants over time to look at kill rates. And it's surprising, um, how much it takes to actually knock these microbes out. Not all microbes, microbes in nature have not evolved for these really harsh 
environments and I'd say harsh environments relative to a natural soil system. But for the microbes that have been selected and formulated for hydroponics, these microbes are very robust and they work well. And so, you know, what you would do, and it's, it's kind of speculative because it depends on the technology, you have to rely on the manufacturers or the inventors that they validated the effectiveness, the performance of those products and are giving you the rates of application that have worked best for them. And you have some experimentation. And so, you know, there's some products that are once a week, some products that are continuous and some products that are maybe once every other week, like this Mimma Horticulture Microbial Mass Pro product. And so, you know, what you want to know is how well does that work in your system? And you're talking to the people that made it or the people that are representing it. And you better have, you better ask the questions as the customer, as the cust as the grower, and you better have confidence in those answers. And so, you know, not only can you get confidence from the manufacturer, but you can get confidence from trial. And so, you know, you know, people like to try products and uh, the proof is in the pudding. And so that's why there's such a heavy trial um, in, in all agriculture. You need to try these products. Well, I, that's why we love having you on. Uh, so you could kind of help us understand some of this stuff. And really, I mean, mentally, if I think back to Rhizotonic and, and, uh, and uh, Canna. Yeah, the Canna product. Right. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. that was a rhizobacteria, right? I believe. Anyways, moving I on. So it's in that product. I never <laughs> knew it was in that product. So, so. I had a qu yeah, I had the next ahead. question, I think. But uh, so I was going to kind of summarize. We have a bunch of next questions, and there's also a whole section for fungi, too. So we're going to try to – I was going to try to summarize a couple questions into one. Um, what would you say for bacteria – what are kind of the offensive and defensive uh, capabilities or what have you that they're kind of bringing to the party? How are they helping our plants, essentially? How are they, are they helping the plants take up uh, nutrients better? Are they making the plants stronger? I would just love to hear you kind of talk through those kind of offensive defenses or, or kind of pluses and uh, benefits yeah, that they I'll, bring. I will. And, and, and this kind of ties back to the question I never let JR finish answering, which was or asking, which was across the different substrates. <laughs> JR, yeah. you know, sometimes you just got to say, Colin, you've answered the question. Let's move on, buddy. So I'll talk forever. But the, the truth is, there's, I would call them expectations of these products of, of biology. You have to have clear expectations and they have to be realistic. And those expectations are going to be different across these different substrates. And so, you know, let's, let's go all the way to the other spectrum of living soil. That's what well, I want to talk about. I'll tell about. you what, in, in living soil, let's just say phosphorus soluble, solubilizing microbes are critical. Phosphorus is really tricky to deliver to plants. And in a more complex substrate, it will get bound up. And phosphorus cycling is very important. And those plants need phosphorus. And that same function allows for the liberation of micronutrients and for the liberation of calcium. And so, and the liberation of iron. God forbid. So there's a lot of nutrient cycling that's going to, to occur in more of a living soil format. And that expectation is you're going to be able to maximize the soil function in that particular environment. So let's contrast that with a rock wool environment where you're feeding it soluble nutrients all day long, all day, every day. Well, if you had to guess where nutrient cycling was more relevant uh, for bacteria, either in a living soil or in a rock wool environment. I'll tell you what I would guess, living soil, because it's just inherently the function. So let's take it back to the other side. What else do microbes do that support plant growth? That's the answer. They do a lot. And so there's a lot of data that suggests, well, let's just talk about from early to late if you can maximize the plant's health, and there's not anyone I've heard that said, you know, I'm not so sure if I see a difference in, in microbes just generically over the course of eight years, the ones that don't measure that clear results. But what they say is my plants are happier. They look happier. They've always been healthier since I've added biology to them. That by itself 
enables the plant to maximize its phenotypic potential. A healthy plant is a happy plant, and a happy plant will maximize its growth. There's, you know, um, a function I talked. Sorry, go ahead. One of my questions is, is so when you're in this uh, hydroponic environment and you're feeding the microbes and the microbes are helping with the nutrient cycling, uh, you're pretty much targeting that and there's not a lot of competition or other nutrient cycling that's happening. When you're in a living soil system, you have multiple organisms that are doing multiple exchanges and yep. doing multiple functions. And yep. so by targeting a specific microbe at a massive level, is that disrupting that living soil balance that's in that microbiome rhizosphere section? No, I think it's more interesting. And I think it allows living soil growers to grow with a little more precision. If you're adding a functional targeted microbe to that particular microbial ecosystem, you're I, you're adding that function. You think about uh, microbes in nature. I can collect a handful of soil. I can collect a spoonful of soil. I can collect a gram of soil. JR, and there's over 10,000 microbial species. In that gram of soil, they know how to work together because they are so small. And the scale at that level, because they're so small, allows them to play well together. Fungi and bacteria have evolved together to both interact and help plants and function in a system. So adding uh, a microbe into a particular ecosystem or into a particular microbial community typically has an additive effect. And I've seen that and measured that a lot where, you know, in, in past studies, I have a natural soil and we ask the question, what happens when you add a known consortia? or community into a community that we know what this, uh, you know, tens of thousands in here. And all you do is you add the signal of this particular community into the existing community. It doesn't wipe anything out. Where you find severe competition is typically with food limiting uh, environments. And so you, uh, I think we've talked about this before, the microbial growth growth curve, where early on there's very low growth, then microbes spike in growth, and then they level out when it comes to a food source of availability. And they can be at, they can all exist at a very high level with enough food, and they'll only typically start to wane or start to decline when that food source declines. And the plant roots provide a really nice food source. And, and I'll tell you some other functions just quickly. I want to make sure that we kind of encompass this question. You know, some microbes initiate rooting. That's a value to plant. If you can initiate and get more healthy roots, that's great. Nutrient cycling is always there. Microbes are enzyme factories, and they spit out exoenzymes in the environment, cycling nitrogen and phosphorus. They chelate, which means they can actually liberate trace metals, trace ions, iron, and those are all important cofactors that help the function of photosynthesis and a lot of different plant physiology. There's aspects of microbes where they actually create, in, in some cases, and this is where you know drought tolerance comes in, especially in outdoor, but you can really um, help there. We've, we've noticed and measured in some cases, microbes can excrete this polyglomatic acid, which is a particular chemical species it's almost a gelatin that can hold 100,000 times its weight in water. And so it creates this drought resistance just by creating these sources of available water. Another thing microbes do in some of these, let me ask, let me finish this one thing off, is aquaporins. And aquaporins are, are, are water intake channels across the root zone. And this is pretty interesting. And I have one more, JR, I'm telling you. Microbes, right? I could go on about this all day. They're interesting. But if you think about the plant's ability to take up as much as it can naturally, you're talking about nutrient use efficiency, and the microbes are actually initiating the plant to create more intake channels, the plant can naturally take up ions to allocate as much as it possibly can. And I'd say the last thing that's interesting, you know, we talked about nutrient cycling is systemic acquired resistance and systemic induced resistance responses. And that's almost this next 
black box of understanding that we have with microbes where plants can sense their environment, they can sense the microbes, and the microbes can actually initiate immune responses, either induced or acquired immune responses, which creates all sorts of benefits for the plant. As we in the cannabis industry focus on secondary metabolites, and all of that microbial function in the immune system responses, all of that play to the genetic expression and the full potential of that genetic expression. And I think that's kind of the cool thing. And this is going to lead me on to the next one, Colin, and that is sugars. Um, the plant obviously is doing exchanges. Other folks think that you could go beyond that by adding different sugar recipes uh you on the sh on the previous uh talk you did or talk we had mentioned there's an encyclopedia thick of recipes of sugars that you can yeah. feed to target specific microbes and so can you talk about whether it's good to add sugars or whether you should be letting the plant just take care of that itself I, I wouldn't call it good or bad. I call it my preference and my perspective. And so, you know, that's to each his own. I've never understood it. I've always felt that the plant, uh, it was, it's most interesting to allow the plant to feed the microbiome. And it allows for actually a more natural association of any of those microbes. Ultimately, we are what we eat. Microbes are what they eat, and you can control microbial communities by food sources and species. And if the plant is exuding different amino acids and different sugar uh, concoctions, recipes, exudates that feeds the microbiome, there is a clear association. And, you know, in many cases, the plants and, you know, it's, it's, it's thought that the plants could actually trigger different types of signaling and exudates into the rhizosphere to in initiate different functions as it needs it across the growing cycle. So I think that is, is a very interesting way to approach um, that, that feeding the microbe question. And what about if you're in a hydroponic environment? You would obviously not be feeding it sugars at all, would you? You don't need to. I mean, you don't need to anyway, but uh, that's tr very tricky. And, you know, I think that the common, a lot of the common, uh, depending on the brands, a lot of the common uh, brands now or popular brands uh, really uh, recommend not to add sugars into those recipe mixes. It, it, it's kind of messy, isn't it? In I do have handle. one. I do have one thing about like blackstrap molasses. It has a lot of other things in it, iron, magnesium, all these other things that are those things like the potassium. Is it going to be made nutrient available by the microbe at all? Or is it just going to be sitting in the soil doing nothing? I think it depends. You know, it, it, I think it depends on if you're talking about like a synthetic and you're adding some type of molasses to a synthetic recipe. I would, I would, I'd like to believe that all those ions are being delivered through the, and uh, th through the nutrient program. And so the molasses would be redundant. Maybe it creates a value. I don't have a strong, a strong opinion. Um, molasses, I personally wouldn't use it and I'm biased. I, I started reading a lot of papers a while back. There's a lot of studies on, and this is from a biased microbial perspective where, um, molasses was used as a carbon substrate to feed microbes and there was control plots where it's just the indigenous microbes and they were being watered in and then molasses was being watered in at different levels of other plots and it completely shifted the microbial community because that food source shifted targets uh the it shifted the the community structure because some microbes could eat and take in and process that molasses a lot better than others and so I just felt like it was it it artificially interrupted the community structure unnecessarily. So if you're in a living soil system, that would actually be very detrimental to what you're doing. But uh, maybe if you were in a synganic approach in a bag soil, um, there might be some value there. But I would hey, I'm listen, beginning to a believe lot of people I'm, use it. I'm not saying that people don't get good results and it's detrimental, but 
me personally, I don't understand it well enough to have a clear thought around it. What I do know, and you know, you talk about the plants feeding the microbes. I've done these studies, and you know, back in the day, that's all we did. We lived to collect data and we'd ask these questions. Oh, cool, that's cool. Let's figure this out. And we would measure the microbes in the rhizosphere from very early plant growth all the way to maturity and through death, sampling in the rhizosphere and had a lot of different replicates. And we found the plants were able to stimulate and grow that microbial density at the community level, increasingly across the growing season as there was more root mass and more root mass, more above ground and more above ground, meaning more exudation. And as that plant senesced and died, that microbial community diminished significantly. So it started low it grew to a huge mass and then waned. And so it followed the feeding process the plants were giving it. But, you know, that really shapes my opinion. I think the plants take care of that. I agree. That's really I'm interesting. Beca- uh, yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, it it's fascinating. And I'm really, uh, I really wanted to kind of play the devil's advocate a little bit on that because, um, you know, I feel like people still have that, that mindset. We got into those hydroponic days where they were selling us a bottle of sugar for like fucking 40. <laughs> it's just sugar water. And they were selling it to us for like 40 or $50, you know? And so yeah. I, I, uh, I just wanted to kind of press that issue a little bit because I think if you have an understanding of the way the nutrient cycling is happening, um, the less you kind of bullied that situation, the better off you are. Um, if you're in an ionic chelated situation, um, then it doesn't even really shouldn't really seem to matter or make any sense anyways. Um, but yeah, that was just kind of my, and, and you know, people, people will, ar- will argue that, you know, people that are getting results and doing what they're doing, you know, results speak louder than words. And, and so I'm not pushing back and saying people are doing anything wrong. I'd, I'd never do that. I'm just telling you from my perspective, I don't understand it that well. Yeah. Well, you're coming from a scientific perspective. And I think at some point we have to start diminishing the bro science for the benefit of all of our community. I'll say that for sure. But that bro science and and that's fed by experience. I don't want I don't want to diminish that also because I've talked to guys, generational growers that knew a shitload more than me about the plant and about growing. And so there's a lot to be said about that experience based knowledge that goes way beyond, you know, scientific theory. And I'm basing a lot of my uh, perceptions and opinions on studies I've done or, or 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 hands-on experience, no doubt about it. But, you know, there's a lot of really smart people out there too. (laughs) There's some smart bros that got us this far, right? Yeah. Hey, that guy who figured out 1212, man, we got to thank that guy, right? Who was that? (laughs) I have so, no uh, idea. That's we need to find out, that, right? That would be yeah, who's the first guy that did that? Who's the, that'd be good. Who's the first guy that did 12 12? That'd be a fun one. If, if someone did like a grower Jeopardy or something like that, that would be a good that one. That would be awesome. That, would, that, would, that should be a segment on this show. <laughs> grower Jeopardy. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> we, we probably, none of us probably know any <laughs> yeah. of the answer. So, You're right. Uh, not good. <laughs> um, well, let's go into we've we've got about. 15 minutes or left or so. So we'll have to kind of do some of these, maybe a little bit of rapid fire, but we're going to talk about fungi. So um, could you talk about how kind of fungi fit into this with both of these things kind of get lumped in together often like bacteria and fungi and what, what not <laughs> um, are they often kind of coming together as a package to me as a grower. And then when I'm adding them in, what are they doing? What do they bring into the party? Uh, well, I think that, you know, just know that microbes aren't just magic. I think we know that by now. But, you know, at one point, microbes were just magic. I remember when I first started talking to growers in the market, we're talking almost a decade now, you know, there was no understanding. There's a function. And so all these microbial groups have a function and a purpose. And let's talk about fungi in terms of the function of them. And there's a lot of groups of fungi. And so that's a deep kind of a... Uh, we take the whole time talking about that, but mycorrhizae are a very common group of, of fungi that have been around 
for a long time in agriculture and they were adopted into the cannabis industry. And so fungi are a different microbial group uh, in general than bacteria. Bacteria are single, single cellular, very, very, very microscopic, meaning invisible to the naked eye organisms. Fungi grow filamentously like hairs or roots and a tuft of of fungi typically is called mycelium but hyphae is a a, a, a small strand of them our muscular mycorrhizae act different than most other fungi meaning they almost have they have a symbiotic relationship but it, it almost looks like a parasitic relationship because they start off as a spore or a seed most fungi do let's just start there so they resemble plants that way so plants have a seed and they grow into a vegetative state. So do fungi. And our musculomycorrhizae actually infect the root. And they actually have to grow in the root to thrive and survive. And they create these arbuscular sites where they grow in between the cortical cells of the roots. And they create these exchange sites. And again, the plant directly feeds the fungi sugar through that site. And what our muscular mycorrhizae do is then they take their hairs and they extend beyond the surface of the root zone and they can grow further than the roots grow and they're able to scavenge phosphorus. And so they're not enzymatically capable, our muscular mycorrhizal fungi. They just take available phosphorus, they can absorb it and they translocate that to the plant. And so there's an exchange site within the root in these arbuscular vesicular sites where the carbon is fed sugar is carbon to the to the fungi and in return the fungi gives the plant phosphate and so does that's the, the does, function of that particular uh organism does the fungi kind of exude and then draw it back in exude out and then draw back what it wants no, what's really cool about fungi, and listen, I was a big fungal geek for years because I did a lot of my uh, academic research and with the federal, federal with the Forest Service and and uh, at Texas Tech before and some other, uh, some other natural sites where I was doing a lot of heavy duty research back in the day on fungi. I was in desert systems and fungi really from a microscopic perspective rule those zones because they're filamentous. They can grow out for what at one point a fungi was the largest single organism on earth. Most of it was below ground. We've all heard that. And they do that because they just grow and then they can translocate. Think about a straw. And it's just these little microbial highways that can draw, pick up something way over here and then just translocate it wherever they want to throughout the whole body of the organism. In this case, it translocates it. Say the plants here phosphorus phosphates way out here well ultimately those hyphal hairs will grow out they'll run into that phosphate they they can absorb it into their exoskeleton these uh you know the tube so to speak the hyphae and then it just sucks it and draws it and translocates it where it does and it would translocate at least some of that to the plant because it likes to have it likes the sugar that the plant gives it Interesting. So the guy closest to the plant gets the sugar. What about the asshole way over here who has to pick up the phosphorus? Right? Hey, man, it's all one organism. And so it balances it out. You know, it, it, it so takes wild. care of the whole thing. So that's why it's this huge single organism that's moving through. It's it's amazing. I mean, like. Okay. And, and, and then so before we move on, I just want to open the rabbit hole of fruiting bodies from that. Oh, yeah. Right. And so, so listen, did you study the fruiting bodies? It's a pain in the ass. I mean, mycology is really, really hard. And there's asexual and sexual reproduction. And so those have wholly different taxonomies. And some of those are the same organism, but they can flip into an asexual state and then a sexual state. And they look completely different. And there's groups that are, they talk about a sexual uh, fruiting body uh, of sexual reproduction that's pretty intuitive. It's the basidiomycetes. It's the that group of fungi. And those are mushrooms. And so most of those, none of those are really used in agriculture. But that's a huge swath of mycology or fungal biology. The ascomycetes is the next most important group that create these fruiting bodies. And they're typically very small, but some of them grow bigger, even morels, you know, they're actually an ascomycete, not a, not a basidiomycete or a mushroom. And I don't want to get into the taxonomy too much, but um, yeah, that's, 
to directly answer your question, that's one of the ways you can identify fungi and you have to use a microscope 99 out of 100 times. And you're looking at the structure of the fruiting body. You're looking at the, the color of the spore, the size of the spore, the color of the mycelium and the hyphae. There's so many ways that you have to identify them. And a lot of times you're growing these, these fungi in different media in the lab to initiate sporulation. And you can do that through different media different food sources you can do it through different lighting sometimes you have to zap them with uv and it'll shock them and you know sometimes they turn into like even aspergillus and penicillin which have their own classification well they're completely unique but it's just a version of some ascomycetes that's the sexual stage of that so man it's it's deep i used to teach fungal biology when i was at texas tactic groups and we had so much fun doing it but you just scratch the surface. And, and my professor, Dr. Zach, love him to death. He, you know, he was just obsessed with fungi. So I'd spend summers just growing fungi and, you know, doing microscopic work and, you know, propagated thousands of different species. And so now you probably heard in our news cycle over the last couple of weeks about the fungi they found that will uh, break down radioactive and bioremediate soil that's been radioactively charged yeah so i i didn't really hear about that but i'll tell you it doesn't surprise me at all and fungi in general we talk about the function of bacteria and fungi and fungi like in forest systems and you see forces that are you know wet and mesic forest systems um where they're the the woods degraded and, and decomposed fungi in general basidiomycetes big time ascomycetes also um, are decomposers of really complex, hard, lignin, cellulose materials. And the bacteria are not as competent to really break down those substrates. So the secondary uh, decomposers and mineralizers, where they can transform, fungi transform from big into much smaller than the uh, bacteria okay. break down even further yeah. into the ionic. And so fungi, most of them, the call them saprophytic fungi, the free living decomposing fungi, which is the huge groups of basidiomycetes and ascomycetes, very different from our buscular mycorrhizae, which they call um, glomus, or I think rhizophagus is, is another right. uh, genus for that now, but it used to be called glomus. So the, the other thing about mycology is they don't, you know, they don't hold on to their names. And so someone gets a bright idea and wants to change all the names. And now it's just thought that was irritating. Doesn't make any sense, you know, hold on to the name, but it's the same thing. Glomus aren't, aren't enzymatically capable. Glomus are not decomposers are not great mineralizers or scavengers. And so they just really live off of the plant and they help scavenge available nutrition, phosphorus in particular to feed that. And there's, Indo and, and ecto, you know, which are different groups of right. kind of mycorrhizae that associate with different plant groups as well. Thank you for walking us through that. That was interesting. I had one last, because we're almost out of time. So I'm going to throw out like one last question from me and then I'll let JR ask another one or two questions. But for me, it was a bit um, kind of taking it back to growers. Um, I'm very confused about this sort of stuff. Like, I feel like I've heard uh, uh, things about, oh, you need to inoculate your soil and things like, you know, way in advance. Like, you know, your soil has to be inoculated because it takes time for the populations for these things to be built up. It just seems really confusing to me and I don't really quite understand because there's obviously a lot of the things in the bottles also talk about, like you were talking about application rates of every two weeks or every week or every few days or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of confusing to me and I was kind of curious if you could kind of give growers some tips like let's say i'm starting up a grow should i start inoculating my soil like a few weeks in advance before i start putting a plant in there or you know just curious what gotcha. your thoughts are hey listen that and i don't want to i don't know what everyone else is saying so this is just again colin's perspective but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me for, for the same reason i already talked about in that one study the plants are gonna and i've grown microbes for a long time they're not going to do anything without a food source that they can actually grow in. And once they grow bacteria, they kind of clonally reproduce. They get to, this is how, that's how they grow. There is a cell to say, this is one cell. 
once they get to a certain size and they keep on growing, they're eating a lot, they're eating a lot. And at one point, the surface area to volume of that cell becomes inefficient. And then they separate into two clonal and then they get big and then they separate. That's how they grow. And so they bud out like that and they just reproduce. That doesn't happen without food. And so if you don't have a food source and, you know, some type of hydrology, which typically you'll have that, they're not going to grow. They'll just sit there. And, you know, what I think is the plant is that food source as good as any, you know, if you have soil and if you want to feed them a sugar, they'll grow because they need that car carbon's a currency of all life on earth for us and everything else. And for microbes also, you know, the only the only organism that doesn't directly eat carbon in some type of hard form are plants. They eat it in a gaseous form. They take up CO2 and then they convert it into biomass, which is the foundation of what everyone else consumes as far as carbon. We're either eating plants or eating things that eat plants, period. And so, you know, do I think that the microbes were growing in that environment without a food source? No. And so if you inoculated with precision when the plants are growing, that's kind of what my recommendation would be, but it just depends on, you know, I would, I would actually want to hear the rationale for doing that before I could think about it any clearer. Uh, one of the things I was kind of introduced to microbes was uh, the uh, giant pumpkin growers, um, oh, they yeah. always use the mycos and the azos, right? From Extreme oh, yeah. Garden. Yeah. And I've been using their products for a very, very long time. And their sales logic uh, was always that uh, all these microbes that you're introducing need to be at the root when they wake up, right? They can't just be off in the distance when they wake up or there's not going to be anything for them to get down on. So I always do that you know, backfill, pull out, dust the hole with azos, dust the hole with mycos, water in. And so can you talk about those direct root application versus stuff that waters down into the soil? Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Versus soil drench. Well, I, I think that getting it to the to the roots is the, is the goal. That's that is the goal. I, I've never used products. I didn't want to get right into that root zone. And so that's the value of it. And it's kind of the same thing I was talking about. If it's a, if the microbes are are disconnected from the rhizosphere or that root zone, they're going to have let's just say at least much less access to the exudates that the plants are putting off, and a lot less habitat. I mean, I think people, if you looked at the uh, at uh, at a magnification of just uh, across a cross section of a root, it looks like the Canyonlands of Utah. It's not smooth. It has these surface areas that are built into it to create as much surface area as possible because roots absorb and more surface area equals more absorption sites. But all that surface is what the microbes like to adhere to. And so not only are you talking about access to that exudate, but you're talking about a safe home that the microbes love to be at. And so within that habitat, we used to call it uh, hot spots in desert systems because it was so hot and dry everywhere. But then you'd see this bush that can just withstand anything, if it's old mesquite bush or anything else. And you take a sample there or out three foot from it. And we do this stuff all the time. I mean, I worked in Big Bend National Park for six years. I spent 48 trips down there when uh, and sampling, you know, we just spent all the time out there completely different microbial uh, uh, microbial profile because these microbes are getting fed at the habitat of that rhizosphere in the root zone around plants and there's a lot of bare spots in deserts and when it's yeah, bare, seen that it's hot and there's no food and so you'll find dormant microbes in those zones but you're going to find a lot less and you'll find fungi because they're very environmentally tolerant to heat and to drought also and you'll find a lot of endospore forming bacillus dormant bacteria because they can withstand that well you'll find all those plus active microbes in a root zone because that's where that's where the stuff that's where the party is the roots are where the party is let's 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 deliver everything to the party and so with mem we'll kind of get back to the mem 
Um, talk about its delivery method and how it's kind of uh, setting you up for success. Well, listen, everything that uh, the company had set up before I joined the group was in Canada. They enjoyed a lot of success in Canada for years, and there's a lot of high-tech facilities. And Grodan was the predominant substrate. That's how I know it works so good. And so it's precision irrigation, drippers into the rhizosphere, and a lot of it's these cocoa blocks. And another thing that it did well and, and, and early on, there's a lot of publicly traded companies that call them licensed producers, LPs in Canada, and they're very bureaucratic. And so it takes a long time to get products through those systems. But the, the company and the guys, great guys in the company, position the product as an early root, a root stimulant. And it's a, it's, it's a phosphorus solubilizing microbe, but these two microbes do a great job of initiating more roots. And so let's start here. And then, you know, that's a two week deal. It's highly concentrated, one one mil per gallon. I mean, come on, put it in your cloning machines. There's a lot of these cloning machines. And people were seeing great results, significantly more results, more clone vigor, more success, more roots. And then that was uh, kind of the foot in the door to, to teach these facilities how to keep it going. And so it's it's a precision microbe. It's a functionally targeted microbe. You know, you know what I will, my background. You know, I, I'm more on the specific, the targeted, the shot, the the sniper approach instead of the shotgun approach. There's microbes that are kind of general function, and you you can tell when when you hear the function. There's just kind of overall general microbes, and you know, one of the questions that was asked there's bacteria and fungi, and a lot of mycorrhizal products actually come with a whole series of typically bacillus, but other bacteria as well. And they're trying to leverage the value of the function of bacteria as well as the fungi. It's a good approach, but there's a lot of function that the bacteria are, are providing. The fungi might not be providing. So it's a great one to punch with the products, but it's not just a fungal effect. If you have uh, the mycorrhizae with bacteria, mycos is an example where it's a mycorrhizae. Azos has that nitrogen fixing bacteria. And so they're pretty specific in their functionality with, with that brand is. And I, I know them really well. I mean, everyone knows them with those two products. Yeah. I, um, I like, I like the idea of keeping those separate. You know, it's like we kind of are getting that idea of keeping our Cal and our mag separate, um, it's also good to keep these kind of things, I think, uh, it, it's maybe not necessarily always an application, but in your mind and how you're approaching it. Um, I know that one of the things with fungi is you want to get that fungal dominance started early and you don't want to have super heavy drybacks where you're going to, you know, impede that sustainability. Yeah, I would say, especially for mycorrhizae. They do a lot early on for the plant, less so later in the growing cycle. They've already infected and they're already there. If you wanted to add a mycorrhizae late, it probably wouldn't do a lot of good. You know, no, you I don't want to start so that early. But then there's some other bacillus and azos and nitrogen in particular. Mm -hmm. that you think about that through the veg, so the mycorrhizae, then, then a, a veg or a nitrogen-focused product. It's very intuitive for the first couple of growing cycles for uh, for cannabis in particular, root, veg, and then you look for some flowering solutions. Well, I got to tell you, uh, mammoth and azos and mycos and recharge have been kind of my microbial approaches to my what used to be a synganic style of growing i would have yeah. a lot of biostimulants organic soils but i was using a salt base as my meat and potatoes kind of thing sure. and so uh now that i'm moving into this living soil system um i think the way that i'm approaching uh, the microbe is a little bit different um I'm hitting my fungi early, like you said, make sure you get that fungal dominance early and established. Uh, and then I'm giving those bacterial loads as I go, um, but I'm finding in, fl in flower, uh, I'm not giving the uh, consistency of application. Uh, for sure, I'm not giving them uh, dusting of um, uh, mycos when I flip into flower going mm -hmm. from a two gallon to a 15 gallon. Mm -hmm. um, I do give them that dust of azos to help them get through transition and, and cycle. And I'm always using mammoth pea in flower as my delivery. So what I'll do 
is the, the when I know I'm about to flip, I'll start those last two waterings before flip with mammoth. Then I go into my larger pots and I'm targeting with mammoth all the way through up to about week seven. Then I'll cut it out. Um, when I'm using the Azos and the Mycos, those are only dusting at transplant. I'm not watering in with those at all. Um, right. I, I think the other thing we need to talk about is uh, uh, using these microbes in a efficient way with your budget. And can you kind of just, totally. I'll make that the last thing we talk about, and then we'll let you shout it all, shout it all out, Colin. Well, listen, I think that's important. And it's got to work. It's got to work not only for the plant, it's got to give that return and it's got to be economic along the way and feel right about it. And so, you know, I think that that's been a huge challenge and, and one of the, the major um, uh, challenge meaning um, real important things to achieve uh, as a manufacturer that it is a very efficient usage. That's why you find these microbial products are highly concentrated. And although there might be a little higher price tag, you know how long the concentrated products last at that mammoth, you know, we know 0.6 mil per gallon, uh, microbial mass pro, one mil per, one more per gallon in cloning, two mil per gallon veg bloom once every other week. And so there's ways that you can make that work. But that's always a challenge, not only to make sure that you're getting consistent performance, that it makes sense and getting it in the program, but that the economics are never in question. And so, you know, that's where, you know, I'll tell you, microbes are not the most important, most popular product in cannabis cultivation right now. They've never been. <laughs> I would say, if anything, 10 to 15% of growers use microbes probably and so there's a lot of room and i take that as a personal challenge to get it's some more changing. adoption yeah it's yeah yeah I think it so. is changing i'm seeing so. a lot of guys start adding bio organic biostimulants and microbes into their into their systems because those secondary metabolites that we're talking about when you People look at the do grow when you look at the do gross cup uh, our last three years of winters were living soil uh, yeah. If you look at these guys who are killing it in the rosin game, winning all these cups, these guys are using organic living systems to produce their cannabis. And it comes down to those secondary metabolites in that aroma, that flavor and all of that. I'm not That's saying right. you can't I'm not saying you can't get it synthetically. But what I'm saying is the winners seem to be the folks that are leaning in these directions. Uh, you yeah, listen, I. I I'm out a lot and there's not one person I haven't run into that doesn't, you know, if they're pure salt and salt's important, I think you should, you know, use salt. Sure. But these guys, even if they're trying to be loyal to a program, they're adding something in because they learned you have to get something in at least later in that growth season to stimulate exactly what you're talking about. The extra resin production, uh, that extra nose, those terpenes, those details, don't always express themselves as well as they could without that act that, you know, that additive, that biological additive. And I think about the microbes doing a great job that, you know, you've been using mammoth for heck, as long as I've known you, which is probably a decade now. Yeah. Yeah. I have. And I still am using it because they hoard a bunch of it out on uh, Amazon and I swooped up a bunch of it. There's like only one size left that you can get. Um, so um, yeah, it's yeah a shame. my, that poor my mammoth, got mismanaged. I, yeah. I feel bad about that. And that's the topic yeah. for us to talk about at a later date, my friend. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, listen, it's um, it's always a pleasure being, being on the show it, it, you know, I could talk about this all day, guys. Yeah, we Me appreciate too. you hanging out with us. <laughs> um, where can people go to learn more about your company? Yep. So listen, go to you can go to to my LinkedIn. You can call in W Bell. You can go to my Instagram, call in W Bell, the real Dr. Colin. Those both have links to the website, mimhorticulture.com. Um, you can also go to mim horticulture you can go to jeff at mim hort um it's it's out there so we just did uh we, we we're gonna continue to do 
as good of a job as we possibly can just to kind of stay in front of people. And, and, and the truth is this is, this is the real deal. I mean, the microbes are an important part of growing. It takes a lot to grow these plants. And, you know, we're, we're thinking that this nature tech approach of these target functionally targeted microbes are one uh, in many cases overlooked or under or underutilized tools that growers can use to take that plant to that next level, just to maximize that phenotypic potential from a quality bumping up and, and yield in many cases. If you, if you don't know, now, you know, <laughs> now, you know, sucker. <laughs> well, thank you so much, man. We really appreciate your time calling as always. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, if folks are watching or listening, please make sure to support Colin, check out his company, their products and, uh, leave positive comments and likes on the video. We appreciate it. it helps, uh, <laughs> proliferate out through the internet and the algorithms. Um, Shout outs to our supporters, everyone in the cannabis community, our sponsors like Lost Coast Plant Therapy, Sacred Three Mushrooms, Tiki Madman, um, also and heliosupply.com. Um, and then lastly, I was like I said at the top of the show, if you're a company out there and you're thinking about your 2025 budget and you want to sprinkle a little bit of it on a YouTube show, let us know. But um JR, thanks for hanging out today. Thanks for putting together the show. I hope everyone has a great rest of your week. And as always, JR, Rower's love. love. Peace.